The following is a CNN special report. I dedicate the cable news network. Good evening, I'm David Walker. And I'm Lois Hart. Now here's the news. This is CNN Breaking News. Approximately four shots were fired at the president. A massacre of hundreds of thousands of Tutsis and moderate Hutus. President Reagan has endorsed German reunification. For 35 years, we've been everywhere. Mike Chinoy, CNN, Beijing. The skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. This is one pocket of turmoil in the Egyptian capital. On every story. There's nothing subtle about the horrors of this war. Liftoff of the space shuttle mission. Obviously a major malfunction. I'm going to have to interrupt this call. Police believe that O.J. Simpson is in that car. In danger. Oh, quick, let's go. And under fire. Israeli officials say they're going to try to use restraint. We can see the people below, trapped on Sinjar Mountain. Covering the devastation. I'm outside this pediatric hospital. Just take a look inside. We will help! Some of these people have been waiting outside now for more than three days. I've been seeing dead bodies in the streets here in Mississippi. As far as we can see, under blue sky, it's totally level. The drama. Princess Diana has died. George Zimmerman not, not charged with anything in this case. The terror. About a third of the building has been blown away. There has been a second explosion. <laughs> What normally would be the World Trade Center is no more. Two possible suspects in the Boston bombing. And triumph. The rescuers are making progress literally by inches. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden. USA! USA! It's so rare that we get the cover stories that have a happy ending. Making news. Director Hellman, can you talk to us, please? And breaking news. I can't move. I'm, a, I'm not going to resist a police officer. What is going on in Ferguson, Missouri, in downtown America? Here come flashbangs and canisters coming right up at us. 35 years of CNN. 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 This is CNN. Hello, I'm Wolf Blitzer. There's a lot of memories in that sequence you just saw. When Ted Turner launched the first 24-hour news network in 1980, many thought it was a crazy idea. Some referred to CNN as chicken noodle news. Not anymore. 35 years later, more people get their news from CNN than from any other global news source. CNN is the place where the world gathers to follow breaking news and to witness extraordinary events some that impact the lives of millions, and others that focus on just one life, like the tense 58-hour drama that played out live on CNN in 1987, after baby Jessica fell down a well. What started as a child's innocent game turned into a child's terror and a marathon rescue effort to save her life. When we found out the local station had a life truck, we jumped on it. Little Jessica McClure was playing hide and seek, Jessica tumbled down a pipe and landed in a small area about a foot wide. She was trapped 20 feet underground. I can see that it's just really a really gripping story and that it's not going to be resolved quickly. Blow out all the commercials. Stay until it's over. She's upset and crying. As long as she's crying, we know that we have a chance. It has gone frustratingly slow. When we got there, I started knocking on doors, and I would say, I'm Tony Clark from CNN. We're here to cover the rescue attempt of Jessica McClure. I need your help. We're trying to shoot over the fence. Do you have a ladder that we could use? You knock on another door and say, I hate to ask you this, but can I use your phone? That was the day before cell phones. Cameras and microphones have been dropped down. Jessica can be heard to call to her mother. You could not widen the well that she was in, and you couldn't come in at an angle. They drilled a shaft parallel to the one Jessica fell in. So what you had to do is drill a parallel well that someone could get through. 
The rescuers are making progress literally by inches. It was scary. Lord, help us always to remember that we're in your care. This is a, a gripping story because it's about a helpless little baby who had a name, who had family there. That's the daddy right there. With the whole community gathered around, trying anything they could to get this baby out. It's a great story, a great human interest story. For the second night, floodlights have lit the backyard. As the hours went on, you thought the chances of her surviving were less and less. The ratings took a huge jump. People are calling their mother-in-law, hey, turn on CNN. People who had never watched CNN before are now going to CNN. A two-inch hole was drilled into the cavern where Jessica McClure has been trapped since Wednesday. In Midland, Texas, they're in the final stages of what appears to be the imminent rescue of Jessica McClure. Trapped they had sent a medical worker down who was going to recover. You could see the lines tightening, and so we knew it was going to happen. We're expecting to see Jessica just, just any moment now. Holy shit. I was very fortunate during all of my years at CNN to cover a lot of interesting stories. You can see the enthusiasm, you could hear the applause. But this is one of those that is very special because it does have a happy ending. And that helps solidify our presence to the public that when there's a major news event, you know that CNN's gonna stay with it. The applause for the paramedic who just, who had brought her up. People have worked very hard to come to a very happy ending. I'm Tony Clark, reporting live from Midland, Texas. Something is happening outside. You're damn right something is happening. War is breaking out all around you. Approaching Lockerbie about seven o'clock, and the whole sky lit up. Our witnesses on the ground say they do not see how anyone could have survived. 11,300,000 gallons of crude oil has spilled into the calm waters of Prince William Sound off of Alaska, 25 miles outside the Alaskan port city of Valdez. A major earthquake registered between six and seven on the Richter scale in the Bay Area. Game three of the World Series has been canceled. The government is, has ordered us to shut down our facility. We're, we are shutting down our facility. Okay, we've heard the orders. We have our instructions from headquarters in Atlanta. Goodbye from Beijing. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The events in East Germany are moving ever more swiftly. After 27 years in prison, Nelson Mandela is now free. The skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. In 1990, the UN ordered Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein to remove his troops from Kuwait or else. But he refused. As the U.S. prepared for war, so did CNN. With a small staff at the El Rashid Hotel in Baghdad and unique technology called a four-wire that kept them connected to CNN's newsroom, broadcasting live as Operation Desert Storm began. An explosive development near the Persian Gulf. There is no place for this sort of naked aggression in today's world. The failure of the Geneva talks seems to have convinced the Pentagon that war is imminent. I don't think that the world really accepted CNN until the first Gulf War. The president had laid down the gauntlet and he basically gave us a window of when it was gonna happen. So we had prepared everything for it. I recall that during this time of preparation, I'd wake up from my sleep about 3.30 in the morning, think that this is ridiculous, planning to cover a war with television? It's unheard of. It was very, very 
worrisome for all of us at CNN because we had producers in Baghdad. We have camera crews in Baghdad. We had three reporters. Bernie Shaw was there, John Holloman, Peter Arnett. They were all there. The management at CNN, Ted Turner uh, and Tom Johnson, were under enormous pressure from General Colin Powell, from other U.S. officials, from probably from the press. Get those guys out because once the air war starts, we don't know if they're going to be okay. But our responsibility is to our worldwide audience. We will stay, we will cover this war as best we can, and we will report on the war. Military experts say a night air attack is the likely scenario for the start of any fighting. Moments ago, before I that came night, the I was at the Pentagon. the Pentagon. I had a chance to see two very senior Pentagon officials almost running through the halls, going up. They the couldn't say Chinese when office. this was going to begin, because that could endanger US troops. It was shortly past midnight, Baghdad time, and I was walking past the open window, and coming down from the sky, the black sky, looked like silver paper. I knew instantly what it was. It was chaff, radar jamming chaff. Tonight, the battle has been joined. As soon as that chaff started filtering down to the ground, all hell broke loose. I was walking by the control room and I could hear the commotion. I walked in and there it was. Our team in Baghdad was restricted. They weren't going to get much information. The only thing they could do is report what they were seeing. But he doesn't show any signs of it. We have to go to Baghdad, Secretary. Uh, we're, we're going to Bernard Shaw in Baghdad. Uh, this is... Uh... Out of my mouth came the words... Something is happening outside. You're damn right something is happening. War is breaking out all around you. The skies over Baghdad have been illuminated. We're seeing bright flashes going off all over the sky. The walls were shaking. The windows were vibrating. The concussions were blowing us against the wall. So we've now been on the air 20 minutes. Now the sirens are sounding for the first time. The Iraqis have informed us. And the line goes dead. They just cut the line. Everybody is stunned and it's totally silent. And you can feel the tension in that room. And John Holloman said, it's a battery. The battery's dead. And of course, our biggest fright was that the bomb had hit the hotel where they were. Hello, Baghdad. Line's dead. There was a hush in the control room. And we're running around trying to find the batteries. We find it. Holloman does a workaround. Hello, Atlanta. And we come back on the air. Atlanta, this is Holloman. I don't know whether you're, you're able to hear me now or not, but I'm going to continue to talk to you as long as I can. The sky and there's a collective sigh, been, uh, and you see shoulders drop down as, as the tension leaves people's bodies. The whole world was watching CNN. We were the only ones who had reporters in Baghdad. I look up, CBS, NBC, and ABC are taking CNN. Let's describe Stations it. around the world are taking CNN. The Iraqis shut down CNN. They invoked censorship. So on Friday morning, we packed up and we started to leave Baghdad. News, especially television news, is logistics, logistics, logistics. You can go anywhere in the world to cover a news story. Let's describe to our viewers what we're seeing. But if you don't have the capability of getting that story out, there's no news. We're going to go to a live picture in Los Angeles. O.J. Simpson is in that car. We were the O.J. Simpson network, period. Judge Thomas began to use work situations to discuss sex. As far as I'm concerned, it is a high-tech lynching for uppity blacks. Verdicts against the four police officers charged in the beating of Rodney King. The horrors of this war, ethnic cleansing goes on within view of United Nations patrols. An explosion underground in the garage section of the World Trade Center has killed now three people. Hundreds of people are still being evacuated from the Twin Towers. 
the whole south side of the building is going up in flames literally before our eyes. Four million people driven from their homes by war. The Oklahoma governor's office says at least 19 people are dead, hundreds of others injured, and rescuers continue to search for survivors in the rubble of the AP Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. This is AC. I have AJ in the car. In June 1994, football legend OJ Simpson was charged with the grisly murders of his wife Nicole and her friend Ron Goldman. What happened next? OJ, the fugitive from justice. A nine month trial and a stunning verdict. It became one of the most watched dramas in CNN history. This is CNN. Okay, I'm going to have to interrupt this call. I understand we, we're going to go to a live picture in Los Angeles. This is Interstate 5. Police believe that O.J. Simpson is in that car. But nobody is pulling this car over. Uh, they're Metro. They're SWAT. We got SWAT on the way. Police helicopter is trailing it. They're going south through Orange County. 911, what are you reporting? This is, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay. And I'm sitting in Washington describing this. Now, I didn't know LA very well, so they gave me a map of LA. The car is somewhere by Disneyland. Juice, just toss it. Come on, man. Just tell me. Can you now confirm that OJ Simpson is arrested? Yes, sir. Uh, he is in custody. Finally, after more than seven months of relentless publicity, the double murder trial of O.J. Simpson will unfold before the only people who really count in deciding his fate, the jury. No one talked about anything else but the trial. That's all you could talk about in the coffee shops, in the restaurants, on the street. All right, counsel in the audience, please be seated. Simpson's defense team. In other developments, the extraordinary nature of the Simpson case between 8 and 4.30. We were the O.J. Simpson network, period. It was the first reality show. It really was. Cato mania is spreading across the nation's heartland. It's I knew Cato. the defense team. I knew the prosecution team. I would have dinner with one side and breakfast with another side every day. And you say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. He is the key witness in their case. He is the one that allegedly found the glove. And the pivotal moment, of course. That's people 77. Was the self-destructive act by Chris Darden, the co-prosecutor, who decided on his own to have O.J. Simpson attempt to try on this bloody glove. Boy, he was a great actor this day. Oh, I can't try. The, the gloves aren't, oh, it's hurting my hands. You know, it was unbelievable. Bill Clinton told me that when uh, Yeltsin arrived from Russia, he got off the plane and he said to uh, Clinton, do you think he did it? That's how much the world knew. Well, when you think about it, he was the most famous person ever charged with murder. O.J. Simpson in a knit cap. I remember Johnny Cochran is still O.J. Simpson. Putting on this silly cap, that's an image that I think will be forever in my mind. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Mr. Uh, Simpson, would you please stand and face the jury? Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being. The next night, Johnny Cochran, his lawyer was on my show. With us on the phone now is O.J. Simpson. If we had God booked for that day, we'd have booked God. How are you? I'm doing fine and uh... God, can you do next Tuesday? <laughs> and we'll tape you and we'll run it as soon as this dies down. Pretty soon I'll have all, uh, I have enough to say to everybody and hopefully answer everyone's questions. He said, I'm going to come on your show soon. I'll tell the whole story. Never did. Things uh, no, you... I got to go. All right, well, can you <laughs> so just really tell us, go. How was, what was it like with the Thank kids you. today? What it, was it it's like been, with the been kids? great. It's been great. There have been attacks in two American cities. At the Pentagon, a plane or a helicopter has crashed. I think we all knew it's the act of terrorists.
It is believed that a 747 aircraft has exploded in midair into the Atlantic Ocean. The bombing at Centennial Olympic Park this morning was an evil act of terror. The French government uh, has informed all of us that Princess Diana has died. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. Earlier today, two masked gunmen wearing an all black began shooting at least 18 people. Now that the U.S. Coast Guard is conducting a search for a private aircraft that apparently has now gone overdue. What the election law folk call a hanging chad. The hand count is expected to begin shortly here in a room behind me. A plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. It was a day that changed the skyline and a nation. 9-11, a day unlike any other in CNN's history. The collapse of the Twin Towers, the Pentagon burning, a field in Pennsylvania that became ground both horrible and hallowed. Thousands of lives lost in the deadliest attack ever on American soil. Amidst the tragedy, CNN's anchors and reporters shared with viewers their shock, their sadness, and the terrible images we will never forget. Saw a plane crash in yeah, Which was described to me the size of a 747. We have unconfirmed reports this morning that a plane has crashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. We heard a big bang, and then we saw smoke coming out, and everybody started running out. My producer called, said he listened to the radio. And I said, no. He said, you should. And he said, a plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I didn't know if it was a big plane or a small plane. It was an accident. It was deliberate. But when the second plane hit the South Tower, I think we all knew it's the act of terrorists. I started driving towards the Bureau. I could see people in Washington were driving the other way. People trying to get out of Washington, people were freaking out. At the Pentagon, a plane or a helicopter has crashed and the Pentagon is being evacuated. Ted Olson was a friend of mine and his wife died on that plane that hit the Pentagon. And she called him before they hit the Pentagon on her cell phone. And he had to tell her that uh, two buildings had been hit in New York. And they said goodbye to each other. She knew they were going down. The Boston airport, like airports now across the entire country, is closed. All air traffic in the United States has come to a halt. And then we heard that there was another plane maybe going towards the Capitol. Another plane wanted to go to the White House. People were running out of the White House. People were running out of the Capitol. There has just been a huge explosion. We can see uh, a billowing smoke rising. And I can't, I'll, I'll tell you that I can't see that second tower, but it, there was a cascade of sparks and fire. And now this, it looks almost like a mushroom cloud explosion. And then what happened to me and what happened to every person on planet Earth who had access to a TV is that a clock started ticking. Because once that first tower fell, you knew that the second tower was going to fall. United Flight 93, Newark to SFO, has crashed in Pennsylvania per United Airlines. But some very brave passengers attempted to take control of that plane because they knew from phone conversations that they had had with family members that the World Trade Center had been attacked. Can you imagine the courage? There have been attacks in two American cities, New York and in Washington. The trade centers here in New York have been hit by airplanes. In Washington, there, has, there is a large fire at the Pentagon. The Pentagon has been evacuated. And there's, you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. 
Good Lord. There are no words. It was so eerie to stand on the rooftop where we were broadcasting from. You can see how tough it is for anybody to sort out the magnitude of what this city endured as well as what Washington endured today. When the wind shifted, you could smell the jet fuel, you could smell metal burning. It was one, two in the morning, it was late. I was tired and I, I was crying. And I was thinking about, I, my daughter was sort of middle school and I thought, God, her world is t gonna be totally different. It's, it's gonna be totally different. 9-11 forever altered the soul of our nation. We could never again take for granted our sense of security and life has never been the same since then. I had a satellite truck with me, I had a crew with me, and we were kind of on our own. Because as you can see, it's coming apart as we speak. I reported a few minutes ago about a second wave of attacks. They are being described as more intense. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes in Afghanistan. Um, got a little problem on the Space Shuttle Columbia. It has been out of communication now for the past uh, 12 minutes. My fellow Americans, this day has brought terrible news that Columbia is lost. There are no survivors. More explosions have rocked Baghdad after an unprecedented bombardment a few hours ago. U.S.-led forces have unleashed their long-awaited and punishing air assault. In Spain, at this moment, they are still counting the bodies. At least 190 people are dead. Hundreds are reported dead in Sri Lanka as a powerful earthquake off Indonesia triggers devastating tidal waves across parts of Asia. I deserve a fair trial like every other American citizen. I will be acquitted and vindicated when the truth is told. We, the jury, find the defendant not guilty. Four separate, uh, yet simultaneous explosions striking the transit system there. The real concern is the wind uh, and the rain and any flooding that may cause. Katrina, to many it's a simple name, but for the people of the Gulf Coast, it means so much more. For them it represents death and destruction and the nightmare of August 2005, Hurricane Katrina. CNN teams were positioned across the southeast United States as the powerful storm hit. When the wind and rain subsided, they found utter devastation. Homes, neighborhoods, families wiped out. More than 1,800 dead in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, and Mississippi. It was more than some CNN reporters could even bear. Their reports filled with dismay, grief, and eventually anger. A powerful hurricane appears to be setting its sights on the central Gulf Coast. The winds are just incredible here in New Orleans. We can see the roof of the Superdome has been shredded. This may be the easy side of the storm, but it does not feel very easy uh, right here on the banks of the Mississippi River. Uh, it's a very strange feeling covering a hurricane, particularly one that was this size. Got there really just as the first kind of rainfall was starting. The winds have really picked up here. I had a satellite truck with me, I had a crew with me, and we were kind of on our own. Because as you can see, it's coming apart as we speak. Went to a, I think it was like a Walmart, bought some supplies. I was in a Walmart uh, earlier in the day, uh, and, and people just come up to you at the Walmart, and, and they're like, have you heard about my town? Do you a woman at the Walmart said to me, you should go to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi because um, we haven't been able to touch with our relatives in Waveland, and no one's reporting from there. When I got to Waveland, that was unlike anything I'd seen before. Just block after block were, were, was gone. 
people were starting to return and see their lives gone. <laughs> it's devastating. I mean, um, um, actually, it's... I went out with this FEMA body recovery team. We went to the house of a family. Their last name was Bain. Once you stepped on their porch, you could smell them. Everything was ripped apart and things were on the floor and it was very chaotic and there was mud everywhere. And then they found them. These four people, a man and wife and two children, have died in this home. They had drowned in their living room and it was a husband and a wife and two of their kids were special needs kids. But there was really nothing they could do. They marked an X on the door and they put uh, the number four for the number of bodies on the door that were inside. And then they closed the door and they left. A levee break the size of a football field is slowly flooding New Orleans. I am looking over a scene of utter devastation. An entire neighborhood, water has come up to the eaves of the houses. When we got out there, you could hear the screams of people still being trapped in the attics. We came across people punching holes in the attic spaces because the water is filled up all the way up to their attics. What are we doing now, Doc? Where are we going? Uh, we're going to Charity Hospital. Is this area safe? I mean, we heard about the uh, snipers earlier today. Uh, no, <laughs> not really. We had to get a, a rowboat and essentially row across from the parking deck across the street into the, the ramp at Charity Hospital. Okay, well, we made it yeah. safely. So this is what a Charity Hospital looks like in the middle of a natural disaster. When you get into Charity Hospital, you sort of immediately realize that it is as bad, if not worse, as has been described. It was completely crowded. There was a smell in the air. When you started to walk around the hospital and realize that the staircase is now becoming filled with bodies as a result of what was happening there, that you needed to start reporting. This is the parking deck between Charity and Tulane Hospital. Patients here over the last several days since Katrina hit have been trying to get out of here. One of the images that really stuck with me the most was these people bagging patients who had been on ventilators who no longer had power and they would take shifts and you couldn't fall asleep and they had to just keep doing it and sometimes a patient would still be awake and or at least cognizant enough to know that literally my entire life right now is dependent on whether this guy can keep bagging this bag of air into my lungs. For the first time now you can hear and see the choppers to try and take some of these patients out. When the helicopter first landed the two lane patients started to, to be evacuated. Keep in mind, these doctors are sitting here with critically injured patients still. Tulane got all their patients and staff out before they began to evacuate Charity Hospital. And we know that patients died while waiting. And that's something that, you know, I don't think ever leaves you. We want help! We want help! Some of these people have been waiting outside now for more than three days. No food, no water, helicopters flying over. Now get off your asses and let's do something. And let's fix the biggest damn crisis in the history of this country. You know, someone actually said this to me in the days after Katrina. They said to me, you know, man, this is all going to be forgotten. It's all going to be cleaned up and washed away and forgotten. Do you want me to, do you want me to... But I certainly will never forget what I saw. And I, and I don't think a lot of the people who were there, I don't think any of them will forget either. been an explosion at the Boston Marathon. It went from being an explosion to being a bomb. The FBI admits they don't know. And CNN can now project that Barack Obama, 47 years old, will become the president-elect of the United States. This was a neighborhood in Port-au-Prince with apartment buildings. Now, it's the worst devastation I've ever seen. 15-day-old baby, they're, they're begging for a doctor. And now another major story developing in the Gulf of Mexico. 11 people are missing after an explosion and fire on an offshore oil rig. 
This is one pocket of turmoil in the center of the Egyptian capital, but it is throwing the entire country into a political crisis. We're following uh, breaking news out of Aurora, Colorado. 12 people have been killed and another 38 wounded at the screening of The Dark Knight Rises. This water, this is ocean water. There are waves in the streets of downtown Atlantic City. This is where I am. There are thousands of law enforcement personnel on the ground. They do believe uh, that he is in this area. They've been bringing people in. Marathon Monday, Boston's favorite day. For thousands of runners and fans, a moment of triumph. But on April 15th, 2013, two pressure cooker bombs turned the marathon to murder. Three dead, hundreds wounded, suspects on the run. All eyes turned to CNN to witness an unfolding tragedy, a desperate manhunt, and a city struggling to recover. Thank you so much for being with me. I'm Carol Costello. More than 27,000 runners are running in today's Boston Marathon. More than half a million people are expected to line the course. Let's get down to Boston. Apparently, there's been an explosion at the Boston Marathon, I am told. It was big. It was booming. I saw a big mountain of smoke come up. And you know, you saw in the moments after the blast, people, civilians, you know, making tourniquets and saving people's lives. A lot of the injuries being uh, on the lower part of the leg, which indicated a, a bomb that was close to the ground. I started working the phones because I've got a lot of sources in law enforcement. And one of the first significant pieces of information I got was that the paramedics were seeing ball bearings fall out of some of the wounded. Here on the ground in Boston, the FBI admits they don't know. They right. don't know if this is domestic or foreign. They don't know if it's lone wolf or a group. It went from being an explosion to being a bomb to being something that was created based on an al-Qaeda recipe. Well, President Obama made it clear today the bombings in Boston are being investigated as an act of terrorism. And it was late Tuesday, early Wednesday, that they were able to get an impression of who they believed the bombers were. The problem is, is they didn't have the names of these two individuals. They had no idea who they were. But on that Thursday morning, we got wind that they had a photo. Good afternoon. They were going to make this dramatic announcement and ask for help. Find these guys. We are releasing photos of these two suspects. The photos and videos are posted for the public and media to use, review, and publicize. This rules out the kind of lone wolf, crazy person scenario. If two people are together, practicing, potentially, buying these products together, assembling together, they're also planning their escape. We worked all through that night up until the uh, 10 o'clock news, and just about 11 o'clock, our phones are going off crazy. Crazy. Oh my goodness, all units, response. Officer down, officer down. Get on it! Over at Cambridge, a cop was shot. Police are investigating a fatal shooting of MIT campus police officer by two men who then committed an armed carjacking in Cambridge. We hear the scanner, and it is hell's bells, everybody to Watertown. Because there has been a major shootout. Guns drawn, and we have heard multiple gunshots. One of the bombers is dead. The other one had escaped. I was driving over 100 miles an hour. Cops were passing us. We get to Watertown. The police here have warned all residents not only to not come outside, but not to open their doors to anyone. You had police cars. You had military vehicles. Patrols of cops going through Watertown that look like army squads going through Afghanistan. Door to door, yard to yard. We heard numbers between nine and 10,000 law enforcement personnel on the ground. It was an ongoing emergency. It was all happening in real time, on camera. I know, I think I still had my earpiece in and waiting to go on with Wolf. And then all of a sudden I heard that. Just unmistakable. Rapid fire. What was that? Was that guns? Knew exactly what that was. What sounded like multiple assault rifle shots to me. Sounded like police empty in their weapons. 
rapidly fired, and then all of a sudden it stopped. We're seeing some police activity. I'm at Watertown, right by the uh, Arsenal and school intersection. So Fitz ran to the sound of the, the shot. And next thing you know, he says, Drew, they're surrounding a boat. There's a boat. David Fitzpatrick, our producer, is on the scene. David, what are you seeing again? Uh, Anderson, I see armed police and FBI with guns still resting on the fronts of their cars. I see about uh, half a dozen, maybe eight guys in SWAT uniforms. It was about two hours later, I think 8 o'clock, that he finally gave up. When Jahar Sarnayev comes out of that boat, and he's surrounded by hundreds of officers and federal agents, and he's got a red dot on his forehead, and that's because he had a sniper's rifle trained at his head. Captured. Terror is over. That was a tweet from the Boston PD. It was, it was intense. It was intense. I'm trying to find the real story, and getting that out and having people understand that, I, I think is really important to me. That's what we do. We want to bring the story to the viewer. We want you to see it. There's very few networks that devote the kind of resources to tell these stories and to, that stay with the story and that arrive at the story as this quickly as CNN happens. does and stays at the story as long as CNN does, even after a lot of other people have left. CNN is there. I'm proud to be a part of that. Where is Malaysia Airlines Flight 370? This is the final resting place of MH17. Another very disturbing video. An intentional act. The protesters have moved all the way down there. Democracy is not there without freedom, and freedom is not there without freedom of the press. This is CNN.